Before we go into this next episode of Stories for the Set, I just want to let you know that I do have audio problems right from the get-go. I was completely unaware of them because everything sounded fine when I did the testing. But don't listen to me. I'm nobody. What you need to, who you need to listen to is Cammy Kidder and Cammy Kidder's story. That is what you really should be listening to. And this is why I started Stories from the Set. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Stories from the Set, coming to you not live from the beautiful Gramercy Palace in Koreatown. I'm your host, Jesus, the original Jesus. Stories from the Set focuses on people who work in the entertainment industry, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera, not just above the line, but below the line. Today's guest, documentary filmmaker Cammie Kidder. She's currently working on a project called Throw Like a Girl, which deals with women in baseball. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the beautiful, the talented, Cami Kidder. Hello. Hello, Cami. How are you? I'm excellent. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Now, we both went to uh, LACC. Uh, you went a little bit before I did. So this, But this is the first time we're meeting. I've never seen or heard from you, uh, except on Facebook. We're friends on Facebook. Correct. Um, so what made you decide to go into film? What made you decide to go to film school and what made you decide to get into film? Well, it's kind of a big answer, but I, um, I was mostly happy. 80% happy, I'd say, um, working in Vermont. I worked in the ski industry. I was a competitive racer oh. for a long time. And Did you ever meet, uh, what was her name? Vaughn? Lindsay Vaughn. Lindsay Vaughn? No, but they do do the women's, um, they do women's World, World Cup races uh, back there. And um, yeah, it's like, I'm sure the women would be great. I met some of the guys and you know, it's true what they say, don't meet your heroes. Oh, really? Like <laughs> Bodie Miller? Uh, older than that. Um, like the, the Mayer brothers were great, but um, Bill Johnson, remember Bill Johnson? I follow, do not follow skiing. He just all. had one of those crazy like runs where he, he actually won the men's downhill back in the, probably the eighties mm -hmm. and uh, no American man had ever won it before. Okay. And it was this huge, huge story. And when I met him, it was awkward. <laughs> Why was it awkward? <laughs> Well, you know, I was like, oh, you know, you were fan, fan, fan fangirling, fangirling a little yeah. bit. And he literally gave me the up and down and scratched his belly and uh -huh. went, you know, kind of gave me the Joey, you know, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, no, like, no, oh, no, no. You were supposed to be like awesome and cool and inspiring, not right. not like a creepy old man in the bar. <laughs> Um, and unfortunately, he had a he tried to have mount a comeback and had a suffered a serious accident and, and died of a head injury. Yeah, I don't know um, how Lindsey Vaughn came back from both knee surgeries. I mean, that's like, that's crazy because I have a friend. I, I saw them go through knee surgery, and you know, uh, it's, I've seen a girl's leg uh, ACL snap after being okayed uh, to. Uh, go back and be physical after all her therapy. I, I heard it step on a soccer field. So you're pulling a lot of so much lot torque of torque on that. Yeah, there's so much torque. I've been and, skiing. That's um, yeah. And so I was I was a competitive racer. But I think, you know, in the final analysis, the the thing that I would say is I didn't I just didn't want it enough. You have right. to want it. Oh yeah. Like like for her, you know, right. to come back and and or you know skaters or anybody that's at that Olympic level, anybody that's like an elite athlete, you just have to want it in such a way that I've never experienced. It doesn't mean we don't sit on our couch and cry at Rudy or cry <laughs> right. at that scene where the hero, the underdog, becomes the hero because we all want that, but it takes a really special person to actually do that with your life. Um, so yeah, there I am just working away in the ski industry and, um, the company expanded too fast and got into some trouble and round of layoffs, round of layoffs, round of layoffs, seventh round of layoffs. Um, I, uh, was, my job was eliminated and that was three weeks before 9-11. Oh, wow. Okay. And 
I was starring in the local community theater. Okay. Doing um, a little stage work. Annie, get your gun. Oh, so and who my, did you play? I was Annie, of you course. You were Annie, okay. I did roller skating. I did trick shooting. I did the whole singing, dancing, the whole bit. And people would come up to me, you know, that had seen the show. And this is a small town. This is right. a town without stoplights. What was the name of the town? Uh, this is, well, Wilmington and uh, Wardsboro, not Wardsboro, Westover and Wilmington. And what Vermont. are the, what's the closest, biggest city? Boston. <laughs> Boston's the closest, biggest city. Away. It's like three hours away. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you have to. I'm this like, is like, not even a city within your state. No, this is the kind of town where you have to drive 30 minutes to get to a grocery store. Oh, shit. Yeah. Um, and that's where Mount Snow is. That's where I was working at the time. And like people would come up to me for months after this performance, Annie was in the summer, uh -huh. you know, uh, I saw you, your voice is amazing. Da -da. And I just started thinking about, is this all there is for me? Is right. this town, you know, I own a house, I have a company car, I have one of the best jobs. Well, I guess it's the question, do you want to be a big fish in a little pond? Right. And is that fulfilling enough right. or are you going to have those questions at the end of your life? That was kind of my motivation. If I'm sitting in a rocking chair, I used to think 65, but now it's like 80. Yeah, right? yeah. As I get older, <laughs> the age goes up. Like, I'm moving to Montana and then it's like, you know, it started off. I'm like, when I'm 40, if things aren't going well, I'm moving to Montana. I turn 40. I'm like, okay. When I'm uh, 50, uh, if things aren't going well, I'm moving to Montana. Now that I'm getting close to 50, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, you know, it's, and that's good because yeah. when we're little, 30 is so old, right? And right. then you know, I didn't even, I still don't feel like an adult at my age. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm like, there's, I'm just not an adult. I'm really not. I'm wearing a fucking Dungeons and Dragons T-shirt. <laughs> you know. So, um, so yeah, so convergence of things, success on the stage, losing my job, and then 9-11, which is sort of the ultimate, right. what are you doing moment for a lot of people? Like, is this my life? Is this what's going to make me happy for the rest of my life is what I'm doing right now and who I'm in a relationship with and all these sort of things. And I decided that I, I wasn't. And what was, why not? Why not check it out? Because I didn't want to be that 65 slash 80 year old person at the end of my life wondering if I was good enough. So I sold my house and I packed up my car and I drove to Los Angeles and I said, I'm going to be an actress, professional actress. And many people come here for that. I'm, a, I'm an LA native, so oh, I didn't really? have to drive anywhere. But you grew up with the dream. Yeah, I was in theater and I was in theater in high school and then I got into college and I saw there was one actually there was one really outstanding actor at Fullerton College where I went to. His name was I don't remember his name is Crest. He currently plays Black Lightning on the WB. Nice. Yeah. And uh he like you saw what it took. You saw like like we had auditions one day for I forget what and everyone was going up doing their auditions and then Cress went up and when he did his uh, monologue you went oh oh that's how it's done yeah okay okay yeah I knew right then and there I'm like I'm never gonna be that good I had that sort of moment. I took a bunch of classes when I came out here because I was in a, a kind of a unique position. I didn't have to get that survival job right? because I just sold my house and I'd had this big corporate job. And even though selling my house in Vermont for twice what I paid for it mm -hmm. did not give me in, enough money to even put a down payment on right, a house because, in Los Angeles. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The prices here are outrageous. Um, but it did give me that cushion to sort of get my feet wet and and so I started taking a lot of acting classes because I was so huge. I was always playing to the back row. I was, you know, and I remember I'm in one of these acting classes and the scene was something about a woman who wanted to give up her children because she had been raped and she didn't feel like she could take right. care of them. Right. So I am acting for all I'm worth. Uh -huh. And the person who was running the class was one of those casting director workshops. She's like, Okay. She goes, the TV's only this big. <laughs> okay. So sit in the chair and just tell me a story. Uh -huh. So I'm sitting in the chair and I'm still, and she's like, now sit on your hands. Uh 
And it took like three times before I finally calmed down enough to just tell my truth as this character. And she turned to the people in the class and she's like, see? <laughs> so it was kind of good to be the example. Right. But she also, you know, that was a five week or six week class. And there were these people, there were these, you know, um, really set apart people like right. your Cress. Right. And she told us all at like the fourth class or something to look around the room and we've seen each other's work and pick the two people that you think are going to make it because that's the odds um, two out of 30 or something which right, i right i think it's even something like less five percent maybe i don't know about today but like back in it, it was always like only five percent of sag is actually working enough that for like, yeah, that's their job that, yeah. yeah so everybody's thinking and everybody is you know whatever and you're picking your people and whatever and then she says if you didn't pick yourself as one of those two people, you need to rethink what you're doing. <laughs> and I hadn't. Right. Because there were two people in the room, at least, that were so much better than I was. Like, this guy would watch read the phone book. Mm -hmm. He was just so compelling. And just he got everything that they were saying. Like, got to have stakes and make strong choices and all these things that they say. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not quitting. Right. You know, because I'm still going to, you know, see what can be done, but I get it now, right. right? Like, and this isn't like I moved here to be on the cover of People magazine. You know, I just wanted to see if I was good enough and see if I could work. Mm -hmm. And I did, and I, you know, did a bunch of extra work, but I was doing it from the perspective of, I want to understand how sets work. Okay. Because again, I'm super stagey, right? right? That's all I've ever done. It's totally different medium. Totally different. And a, and a four camera sitcom is totally different than a single camera, which is totally different than a, a one hour television, which is different than a feature. There's a different pace and just watching, you know, and I think that maybe being a grown up and maybe being engaged, I got a lot of little featured things and I got, you know, some kind of special things um you know i'm still just a background i'm right. still just being paid right. minimum wage like excuse me ma'am <laughs> like, something you know, like that i or... didn't ever get to say anything right. okay. but i'd be the one that was like giving the toast to the main actor to give them an eye line uh -huh. you know Little things like that. I was the Sports Illustrated photographer at the end of Dodgeball. Okay. Sort of my big moment. Okay, at the end of Dodgeball. Uh, I'm the only one in normal clothes. Right, right, right. All the women are quite scandalously clothed. Because you've got the, the, dominet, uh, the, the s and people, right. you've got the cheerleaders, you've got the Dodgeball people, and then there's me taking pictures <laughs> in khakis and a button-down shirt. Um, it was fun. You know, it was like three day shoot and all that. And, and uh, I have a question. What did you learn on that shoot? Because cause this, I mean, it, was it like, oh, it's all routine, I just got to do my thing? Because, you know, Matt Parker and Trey Stone wrote the movie. I don't, I don't think they directed it. Did he direct it? No. No. So, I don't think so. Was there, what was it like watching uh, somebody who's very creative, very successful, uh, maybe not known to most of the public unless you're watching South Park? What was it like? How was he? How was he on the set? Well, um, the strongest uh, uh, person, uh, the you know the the more the one that seemed to be in charge was um, Ben Stiller. Okay, because he is the kind of one of the leads, Vince Vaughn and Ben Stiller, and you know that's kind of how it is on a set. It seems like the top dog sort of sets the tone. Mm -hmm. And I have to say... Oh, you know what? I was thinking of basketball. I'm so oh, sorry. Okay. I was going to be like, I don't think that's <laughs> the people, I but was... I could be wrong. Dodgeball. You're ago. talking about dodgeball. 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 I was thinking basketball. Okay, so please, please forget everything I said. <laughs> what was um, it like? What, what was it like being... Well, Ben Still is really creative, but what was it like even uh, on, on that set? Well, it's... Um... So they had these specialty performers, right? Uh -huh. That's what I technically was, even though I was still just background. And we were treated so much differently than like the general people that oh, were yeah, there watching cattle. the mat. And it was terrible. Like I'm having like a salmon dinner off a food truck and these people are given a bologna sandwich in a bag until they can't even get out of their seats. Right, right, and it was right. just like, that's horrible. And then, and then I did like a show like The West Wing 
where Martin Sheen is like, he fired the craft services person for yelling at background for taking craft service. And he's like, everyone eats what I eat. So that's what I mean. That, that right. person at the top right. really sets the tone where they're just like, no, this is like a $3 million show right. per episode. We can feed everyone. Right. You know, we don't have to make people feel like we're doing them a favor by letting them work for us for minimum wage. Yeah. When, um, when I work on a set as a crew member, I, I, I feel kind of guilty. Like, this is my craft service over here for crew and then this is your craft service over right here which is you know and it's snacks yeah it's snacks. And these are this is not expensive this is right. not like a right. huge like big secret thing or whatever and yeah it's just always really awkward when when they don't when the the, the vibe is not a, a welcoming, right. friendly vibe. I, I'm doing some background again now, but I'm SAG now. Right. And so the calls that you get are different. You know, there might be, I just did a, a thing where I, in the no Natalie Portman movie where I was a NASA scientist and I think there were like eight of us, uh -huh. you know? Uh -huh. And so you're obviously, everybody knows your name right. and you know, everybody, right. you know, you still wait for the crew to go through the food line, right. but. That, but that's out of courtesy. Uh, well, they've got to get back to work yeah, probably because sooner. It's out of courtesy because we set everything up. Yeah, we're waiting around, but you know, we'll make tweets here and there. But you know, when it's time for lunch, we want to eat quick. We want to be the first to eat because we're going to be getting ready for the next shot. If they're ready, we're like, okay, we're going to be going to the next shot. You can start setting up and whatever you have to do. Right. So I, you know, there's been plenty of times as background where we eat last and then we're wrapped after lunch. I'm like, they didn't have to feed us at right, all. Right, they didn't have to feed you. They at don't all. even need us anymore, yeah. and they still fed us. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think my favorite this year is I spent uh, five days running for my life from aliens on the back lot at Universal. <laughs> uh, I've never had any kind of actiony thing where right. I'm like jumping out of buses, and running down the street, and there's aliens. And um, but yeah, so I moved out here to be an actor. And I was taking all those classes. And then one of the classes was uh, a workshop with the artist way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Are you familiar? You know nothing about acting classes, what they do. Or anything. Well, that book, the artist way. Oh, I don't even know about the book. <laughs> so uh, Julia Cameron, okay. uh, James Cameron's ex-wife okay. uh, had addiction issues. And when she got sober, um, she found like a lot of creative people do that she lost her mojo. She couldn't write anymore. She didn't know how to get restarted as a creative person without substances. And so this book is like almost like a step-by-step -step of things you can do to kind of reignite your creative spirit. So obviously you don't have to have a substance abuse problem to read it and benefit from right. it. I don't. And, um, but I mean, it was just like things like go into a store that you would never go in and like find something that you want to take home with you obviously not steal it right. um you know so maybe you would never normally go into a pet store i don't know maybe whatever you're just to kind of break you out of your normal Routine. routines right. and things like that and um and in as part of that class we had to create an original production okay. at the end as sort of a showcase and and I had this idea and oh, I had this, this pod, we called it back then, which before a podcast, which is funny. And, um, and it was phenomenal, you know, and it was so like, we, we scripted things and we rehearsed things and we built props and we, we did this whole thing. And I was just like, I can make my own movies. Mm -hmm. I okay. don't have to wait to let for somebody to let me work in their movie right because that was just about the time you know the panasonic dvx 100 was coming out mm -hmm. steven soderbergh was using it to shoot feature films sundance this is like 20 or 2000 maybe what are we talking about 2003 2002 okay. somewhere right in there okay so everything's changing at that point right. the cost of equipment is coming down and people are starting to realize that you can do your own stuff right so i had this idea um why are there so many storage units here <laughs> I just, I'm from a place where this isn't a thing. And we just, excuse me, but we just cleaned out our storage unit. That's why we have junk everywhere. We're trying to see how much, we're trying to like go through stuff and give it away to uh, Goodwill, you know, because we got a lot of shit. 
which is what mostly happens. Right. So anybody that's thinking about renting a storage unit, let me just tell you, please don't. Um, even when we interviewed the president of public storage, he's like, we had no idea people were going to use this the way they use it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we keep having to build new places. Mm -hmm. And I was really the first one to do anything on storage. So this is pre-hoarders, pre-storage okay. uh, wars, any so of when, those shows. What year is this? This is 2004. 2004. The movie came out okay. in 2005. It's just called Store. And it won some festivals and, and it was very talky. I mean, it was almost like we used all these interviews as kind of a Greek chorus to tell the story of storage. Uh, you know, maybe you have a storage unit because you got divorced and you're being really spiteful because you don't want your wife to have anything, so you're going to stick everything in there and, and pay for it. Or you're hoping that your life will go back to the way it was before, so you're keeping everything. I, I, uh, um, I know of people who have... Uh, gotten big storage units and that's their that's their little studio where they do their stuff mm -hmm. yeah we had a guy who was a race car driver and that was sort of their pit where they worked on the car uh -huh. one of those outside storage units we had people that had lived in them we had people that you know a, a loved one had died and they just couldn't part with stuff you know there's a lot of that um and so anyway I just kind of ran around for like three months with a camera asking anybody that i could find why they had storage units and and coming to some conclusions some sort of big conclusions like you know our stuff is really our identity right and it's so important we we, we put stuff in our house to show people who we are right. these are things i care about right. and so anyway, and then consumerism, that was another big thing. It's just like- We just got a lot of stuff. We don't want to get rid of it. We might need it someday. Right. I'll just hang on to this extra washer and dryer, even though I already bought a washer and dryer, which means I have the financial means to just buy a new one if this one breaks, but I'm going to keep this one just in case this one breaks. It doesn't make any sense. And you're right. paying two, three, four hundred dollars a month oh, yeah. to hang on to something mm -hmm. that in three months you've already spent what the co what the replacement cost would be right. um so yeah that was the first film and and everything was going great and what did you learn what did you learn from doing your first film um because a lot of people go to film school and then make their films but you didn't you went i didn't you went, <laughs> kind, I mean, kind, kind of like kind of like with this podcast right. didn't know how to podcast bought the equipment like last christmas as a present to myself and then it just kind of sat there and then one day I'm just like frustrated with how work's going. Finally, I just said, you know what? I'm just going to start booking people that'll give me a deadline, that'll get me going. And I've, I've made some mistakes. I've gone live on this and it's been like really echoey, but um, I, think I've, I think I've got it under control now. But yeah, sometimes you just got to jump in feet yeah. first. And I found you know, some mentors and it was amazing how willing people were to answer questions and help. You know, I, I, that is probably like the number one lesson in general because i think everyone's we're so intimidated right we're intimidated by producers we're intimidated by directors if we're actors we're intimidated by agents we're intimidated 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 so we don't do anything we stay in this little place and we don't want to upset anybody and we don't want to but by doing that you don't learn anything and you're not memorable mm -hmm. right because they they'll say in casting auditions that the only people they remember are the best and the crazy right, right and you really don't want to be remembered for being crazy but this middle group mm -hmm. you know if they're seeing say 20 people they're really going to remember three people they're going to remember the one who came in dressed in a raincoat for some weird reason and kept barking like a dog and they're going to remember the two that one of which is going to get the job you know what what was interesting when you speak about auditions when i first started in the business i worked for roger corman's company I don't know oh yeah yeah Worked for Roger and I worked as an intern in the casting department as well as answering phones from time to time. And believe it or not, if actors would back out because we were low budget, we weren't paying that much, and if they got a better gig, sure. they were like, "I'm sorry, I got to take this gig. It's more money." And, you know, we got it, but you, but we would call actors who we knew already by the way they showed up to the auditions that they knew their lines before they came in showed up early i can't tell you how many phone calls i made over the year not quite a year but over the six months i was interning that we made to those people uh and who got free work now, they didn't even have to come in and audition we just knew if we give them the stuff they'll they'll be able to rock it you know 
Right. Of course, they had to have talent. We didn't just call anybody, but you know. Right, but they were professional. Right, they were professional. So and that that happened quite often, often there. It you was. know, and they honored the fact that this was a job, right? A, a interview, right. basically. That we never called back for. any crazies. <laughs> no, and and you know, but people think, oh, I have to stand out. Right. I have to take strong choices. I have to do something. You know, mm, yes, but you know, that's not necessarily the strongest choice, right. <laughs> the crazy choice. Casting directors will say, you know, uh, like how people will, you know, send them a pizza every day for a month with their headshot inside the box. <laughs> and they're like, okay, they're like, I remember for, you, but- For pizza. You know, but that's not gonna get you hired or if they can do something even, you know, cause once you, you tip into that crazy zone, mm -hmm. you know, then people are like, I don't know that I wanna put you, I'm responsible if I put you on a set with other people and you're a loon, you know, cause there are definitely some, some, some damaged and challenged people in this town. Let me tell you a crazy story. Okay, so. Probably uh, shouldn't say crazy, right? Well, no, that's insulting, no, it, I, right? It's mm -hmm. really, it's really, you're, when you hear about this, you're gonna be like, what the fuck? So I'm uh, looking for other gigs at the time. Uh, I'm working for Roger Corman because my boss has just left. So uh, normally the assistants kind of like took over after somebody had left. That's just kind of the way it worked, but it didn't work for me because uh, there was just too much to learn in that position. You could just like put me into it. Uh, I need to learn the distribution side, but anyway. So I started sending out my resume to like various production companies, but I didn't send out my resume the first time. I sent out a resume, I just sent out a, 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 a uh, fax, we faxed, I faxed, we were faxed at the time, with a piece of paper that just said, Jesus is coming, my name is coming. And I sent that out and I told my friends about it. They're like, dude, uh, <laughs> this is a predominantly industry with a lot of Jewish people that you're faxing out. Jesus is coming to them. And I went, Oh yeah, I can see how that's not a good idea. And needless to say, when I did send out my resume, I didn't get any calls. Didn't get a lot of calls. <laughs> didn't get a lot no. of calls. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, not that Jesus wasn't Jewish. Right. Right. But, right. but that's, that was just like my thinking, you know, like you know. here I am going to send myself out there because growing up with the name Jesus, I got called Jesus a lot, even by priests. You know, <laughs> priests called me Jesus. I have friends today who call me Jesus. And it, and it doesn't bother, because I had to let go of that a long time, but it doesn't bother me anymore. But to think like that would, that's a smart way of like announcing who I am. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't fly. <laughs> so yeah. I know so you yeah, um, you know, getting noticed in this town is hard. Oh yeah. You um, gotta, Especially today, you got to break through the noise. There's a lot of there's a lot of white noise out there now. Well, you know, and then there's obviously the challenges still. Right. Obviously, right. for people of color, mm -hmm. uh, for transgender folks, for gender nonconforming folks, mm -hmm. and 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 women. It's like, yeah, for some reason, we're all not supposed to have the same dreams. Right, right. Right. Our dreams are not quite as valid. I actually dated a guy when I first moved out here. I met on Match.com, mm -hmm. <laughs> who I I got out of his car at a stoplight. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> because he said to me, "You know, it's really weird to hear me to hear you talk about your hopes and your dreams and your plans." Because I thought women were just fulfilled through their children. <laughs> He said that out loud. In the new millennium and meant it. <laughs> was was he from it? Was he was he from another country? He's from here. He's from here. From here, lived in um, not Encino, but one of those. Lived on the um, yeah. And I was just like, I need to go <laughs> because. And then he was all like, oh, and, and it was just so about like, wanting to have a child, wanting to have a child, wanting to have a child. And I was like, you know, I know a lot of women mm -hmm. and I know a lot of women that that is their mm -hmm. thing. They want to get married and have a child. Mm -hmm. So if you have not been able to find a woman that's willing to look beyond whatever, you know, like this is not right. perfect, but we both want the same thing. Right. 
something is really wrong with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> there's definitely a lot of red flags going on there. Cuz it's not like most women are like, no, I don't want to get married and I don't want to have children. Most women do. So, you know, you just we just need to stop wasting each other's time. Mm -hmm. So I'll just walk home. <laughs> That's great. You got out of the car. I got ditched once on a date, man. She like walked out. She's like, I'm going to go to the restroom and never came back. No, that's just mean. I was being, I was, you know what? I was being cocky. I was being really cocky. And I, looking back on it, it. She just had enough. She just had enough. She's like, I'm out. Peace. I thought I was being funny and witty, you know, but I wasn't. Uh, yes. But, you know, live and learn. <laughs> I, I try and, you know, going through some stuff at the time. But yeah, so yeah. women in this town have a harder time, I think, because, and women in general, you know, in, in the world, because again, we're looked at as, you know, like any career that we might possibly want to have is going to always be secondary to family life and ho how homemaking and stuff. And, and I don't really see that changing a whole lot. You know, that perception is still so strong. Like this idea that women don't make as much as men, the reason behind it is because women don't need to make as much money because they have a man who's making money. So that's why we can pay them less. And because, you know, their kids get sick and they have to stay home from, you know, work. So they're not as valuable to the company. So we pay them less. And women do this to women. I mean, it's so entrenched. Um, one of the, the themes I'm really working with on my new film, which is called Throw Like a Girl, is we're taking baseball as a microcosm for society and really exploring not just sexism, because sexism feels like something that people do, right? It's an overt act, like racism. It's a thing you say. It's an attitude you have. It's a way you behave. But this is more like systemic gender bias that's so ingrained that people don't question it. You know, I think part of the reason is when you look at it, um, women really didn't enter the workforce until the 1940s because all the men were off fighting and they got in the factories. And when something is so ingrained about family and women's roles and men's roles, uh, it's it's really hard to like change something that's, you know, been drilled into you since the time that you were born. Do you know what I mean? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's like, it's not even deliberate anymore. Right. It's, it's a systemic thing. There, there was a study done, um, uh, maybe six, eight years ago and they took women and newborn babies and they asked the women to say, well, how fast do you think your baby is gonna crawl from here to there? Like, will your baby be able to climb up this, you know, pyramid and climb back down? Across the board, women rated their girl babies 30% less capable than their boy babies. Oh, that's interesting. So women are doing this. So it's not like, oh, men suck, you know, they, they keep us down and whatever. Women have bought into this too. Women treat, girls differently we are socialized differently um i had this great this great moment that was should have been this like so francis ford coppola mm -hmm. he's a baseball fan he's a women's baseball fan oh really interesting and he is at the women's baseball world cup where i was filming in august in florida and he's just chatting with people so i sit down next to him he's in the stands we're behind home plate and we're having a chat this man sits down and puts his hand literally like kind of in my face and says, I'm just going to interrupt here. Oh, really? And proceeds to pitch his movie to Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> but the thing about this <laughs> that's so upsetting is I let him do it. Right. What I should have done is said, no, you're going to wait your turn. We're having a conversation. Or you would like to think that, that Francis might have said something, right. but of course it's not his position. He's the one that's being made awkward by this, right. this man. Right. And, and I thought about it so much afterwards. I'm like, why didn't they say something? Why did I just sit there? there? It's a three seat and this guy is talking over me right. and it's being filmed by the way. Right. Oh, well, did you get to put that? <laughs> because he had a camera operator there. Oh, I, it he, wasn't mine. He had, a, ca it, he had, a, he camera. had a camera operator there. So he was filming himself pitching to Francis Ford Coppola. No, it's for it's Coppola's crew. 
Oh, it's Coppola's crew. Coppola's crew. So okay. Coppola's crew is just uh-huh. filming this interaction okay. for maybe a new project or something. So this guy, um, and, and he's kind of like leaning across me and like the whole thing. And I was just like, but what, it, what, what I came away with that is, is I was not, as a woman, socialized to tell a man no. Tell a man, wait your turn. That's what women are told. That's what girls are told. Be patient, wait your turn, be nice, let the boys win. And it ties into everything that's wrong with the society. It ties into Me Too and Time's Up and the rape culture and just why women don't report sexual assault and why all, everything's on women to be the, the, the ones that control the behavior. Right. And right. men can just do whatever they want. So I'm sure this guy didn't think he was doing anything wrong. It may not have occurred to Mr. Coppola that this was, other than it just being rude yeah, it, because you're interrupting. Well, probably for Francis, he probably gets, you know, pitched <laughs> all the time. And he's probably just like, he probably, uh, you, you were watching that. I'm sure he just like, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, cool. You know, he... No, all he said was, good luck with your movie. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a beautiful moment because yeah. he was just like, Good yeah, I'm you not, um, yeah. you know, and I wasn't pitching him my movie. Right, right. You I'm making a movie about women's and ba- women in baseball. I know he's a fan. I'm not going to be like, hey, so do you want to? Mm-hmm. Because that's not what you do. Right. Um, and I don't know. I don't know if he remembers this. I don't know if he's going to remember me. I don't know if he's going to remember my film when it comes out. Um, but it was just this moment where I was sitting there going, I need to start taking up my own space mm-hmm. and and you know and so um so just as a small exercise you know when you're you're coming down a hallway mm-hmm. you know or you're in an airport or whatever and and two people are sort of competing for the same space mm-hmm. women 99 percent of the time will duck out of the way and say sorry mm. and just as an experiment i'm just not doing that anymore and I tended to tip my head, mm-hmm. like somehow I don't belong here. Right. Like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm in your way, random man. And we don't necessarily do it with other women, and we definitely do it with men. And so what's interesting is when you don't do that, how confused men get. Right. Because oh, really? they expect like, it right, too. Okay. Uh-huh. And again, I'm not saying that, that men are doing this on purpose and that men are walking down the hallway, like trying to shove women to the side. It's just how we were socialized that men take the lead position in most things and that women take up smaller space or we're in the supportive role. You know, now that you say that, because I've been, I've been working at the Savant Theater. Uh, by the way, I went to film school. I've worked on several movies, worked on music videos. I'm cleaning up trash now just so I can get this podcast. <laughs> but, um, so the end justified me. But I notice that when I, when the lobby is crowded and I need to get around through people, it, 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 the fact that you brought it up just went, oh yeah. Then it's difficult to get them to move when I'm like trying to maneuver. But the women, not only do they say, not only when I say, excuse me, do they move, but they say, I'm sorry. Yes. And, uh, I, and my, I, I, I remember replying a lot last night. No worries, no worries, no worries. So yeah, uh, you bring it up. I, I, so I it's really that, yeah. fascinating. These tiny things that are, that are everything. And that's what I'm talking about. The systemic, you know, and so it's the same thing with, with women going in for a job or asking for a raise or, you know, anything. And, and so what's exciting now is, of course, you know, the Me Too movement is more than just, you know, Harvey Weinstein being a creep um, and, and all the, you know, and, but the nonsense, the backlash nonsense is, is the ridiculous part where all these men are like, oh, it's so scary to be a man right now. I'm like, well, yeah. try being a woman for the last, you know, like millennia. Yeah, I'm like, um, I'm kind of like, fuck those guys, you know, it's so hard to be a man. I'm like, you if know you what? don't know yeah. that you're an asshole, right. you're probably an asshole. Right. So there's no, there's no ambiguousness here. Right. If you can honestly say, you know, I'm sure even my own father has said something or done something at some point in his life that made an, a woman uncomfortable. That doesn't mean my dad's an asshole. Right. 
It means my dad was socialized to read signals in a certain way and say things in a certain way and bro time and all of these things. In fact, I have an, an ironclad example of this. So this f idea for Throw Like a Girl came out of the fact that I went to Red Sox fantasy camp. Oh, really? To play baseball. Okay. Not too and many women at fantasy baseball camp. I was the only one. Okay. And it did not go great. Oh, really? Because not only am I not, obviously, I'm not a very terrific baseball player, but that's because I've never had the opportunity right. because baseball is something that only boys are supposed to play. But it was 95 guys and me, and there was either, there was kind of two camps. There was sort of the the fatherly, oh, let me show you how to throw a ball, little girl. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Or there was the, you're crashing into my bro time. Oh, really? I'm very resentful of this. Really? Like, this is my vacation. Uh -huh. You know, I don't want to hear a woman's voice on my vacation. I'm like, <laughs> you have problems yeah. uh, that have nothing to do with me. Right. Um, but again, this was, this was right after the Red Sox won the World Series, which was a seminal moment in my life, um, where I just thought everything was going to be different. But when I got down there and realized that I don't even get to have the fantasy of being a professional baseball player, mm -hmm. I started thinking, God, what the hell is going on? Like, I can't be the only woman. So that's where this film came out of. And I started like interviewing people and running around the world. And I found out we have a women's national baseball team. Nobody knows anything about it. I didn't know that. I know about the women's softball team, Yep. but not the baseball team. We have a women's national baseball team. Oh. And there have been women that have gone to, ba to uh, who played professional baseball in independent leagues. There have been women that have gone to uh, college on baseball scholarships. In the 90s, they had a professional women's baseball team. I think they were sponsored the by- The Silver Bullets. The Silver Bullets, right. Yep. They were sponsored by Coors Light. Right? Yep. Yeah. And unfortunately, they, they ran that wrong, in my opinion. They had 100 women show up to the tryouts mm -hmm. and they fielded one team and they took it barnstorming so they never had a home field advantage and they played against men's teams. Oh, well. Why not just create two women's teams right. and put on exhibition games? Right. Why not create four women's teams? Like, <clears throat> why not have a place where <laughs> women aren't always traveling? Right. But I mean, it lasted several years, and a lot of those women became the first members of the women's national team because it started in 2004. So, um, are, are you a big baseball fan? Because I've noticed that uh, Throw Like a Girl baseball fantasy camp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's one of those things that it's actually kind of painful when you think about it that this is the greatest unrequited love story oh, of my life. I have a good question for you. It just popped up right, right in my head as you, you're a baseball fan. You're a baseball fan. Did you see the Dodgers-Brewers uh, games? I did. I did. What did you think of Betty Brewer? The tricky thing is, what I've noticed, is when people think they're allies, but they're really hurting the cause. <laughs> so they're thinking, oh, this is great. Let's have some representation. You know, now there's women representation on the field. Yeah, and she's like, keeping score at the games. Um, oh, I think I'm thinking about the mascot. I'm no, sorry. not the mascot. I'm thinking about the, miss, the okay. Mrs. Met. So. Mrs. Met. Uh, no, uh, Betty Brewer is a well-endowed woman who I know I only watched one game I only watched one game and I got my eye got taken off the play because there was this woman in this low cut top and I'm like what oh I'm like I, and I'm like you know I said to my guy friends I'm, I'm gonna be a guy I'm not gonna lie to you I'm like oh you see uh see behind home plate there and my brother's like oh yeah that's Betty Brewer she uh she uh, keeps score of the game for the Brewers, but you know she is right in camera shot every time somebody's on on screen. That's why I thought you would have uh, noticed mm. that. Did the announcers talk about her? Nobody. Point her out. She was just there. Okay. She was just there, and it you couldn't miss her. I, I I bet you I could like bring the game up on my TV. Yeah. And and you'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah, and I think I would have to say not you know, just spitballing here, that, that she's probably hurting her own cause. She's clearly a huge baseball fan. Right. 
if she's paying if that she, kind of she, money. If she can keep score, for it, that matter. Keeping you know, score is keeping not score easy. Keeping score is not easy. Um, and if she can, you know, and she enjoys it. And she's obviously paying a huge amount of money for these tickets. Because right, they're directly behind home plate. So you would think her intention would be to be taken seriously, but maybe it's not. I don't need to project onto her motivations. Right. Maybe her motivation is to get attention. And that worked. She right. got your attention. She, got, she attention. got a lot of other people's attention. And again, that goes back to how women are socialized. Because until Title IX, which is right. 1972, 1974, um, when Nixon, of all people, um, signed that law, women did not have equal opportunities on the field. One can argue true. we still don't, but there really weren't any. Like if there was girls basketball, it was half court basketball, right. played three on three in the cafeteria because the boys had the basketball court. You know, it's interesting when my mom had to do PE in uh, high school, uh, they had to wear like a uniform, but their uniform was like this long skirt. And if they had to play basketball, they couldn't dribble the ball. They just had to pass it because women weren't allowed to sweat. I swear right. to God, that's what you told me. Well, yes. <laughs> so the women that played, so that includes, that includes me because I grew up in rural New Hampshire. So even though you sign a law in 1974, it's not like the next day, everybody's like, okay, let's fix this. Right. You know, it, it, you keep having to have these battles and you keep having to have these fights. And, and even when I was in high school, girls were not allowed to play soccer. Really? We had to play field hockey because soccer was for boys. That's weird. Cause we had a girl, people were probably close in age. Um, but we had a female, we had varsity and junior varsity. So then the 99ers happened, the women's soccer team winning the World Cup, one oh, of the most yeah. televised sporting events ever, and girls' soccer exploded. They couldn't keep it down anymore. Right. And so now I'm sure my high school does have girls' soccer. But until then, like, field hockey was the game for girls. We played in a skirt. We did all these things. It was all this stuff about sort of, like, keeping it down, like keeping a lid on it. Like, women couldn't be too athletic. That's why they didn't let women run the marathon, because it would damage their reproductive system. That's a great story about how the first woman ran the New York Marathon or no. the Boston Marathon. What are, which Boston are Marathon, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, two of there were two. There was one who ran without being registered, and there was one who registered the next year with her initials. Um, they actually, I think, I think the guy who ran it actually tried chasing her down and tried yeah, tearing tried her to, number off. Yeah, that was I mean, crazy to me. <laughs> that so crazy. I mean, just like what? What? I I truly believe that that all this anger and misogyny and all this kind of stuff comes from fear. So I don't know what this guy was afraid of. Because he obviously wasn't concerned about her ovaries. Right. He had some kind of other agenda that right. this would not stand. And then I love the fact that she ran with her boyfriend and right. some friends and they kept him yeah. away from her. Well, he wasn't going to stay with them anyways. Yeah. You know? I mean, come he was on. an old man. In a, in a suit. <laughs> yeah. Get out of here. We don't need you. Right. Um, you know, women ski jumping was not in the Olympics Are until the Sochi Games. Are you serious? I'm serious. Women ski... I... Yeah, I don't follow ski. You know, I don't. I don't. Winter Olympics, yeah, they're okay. Um, but I didn't know that. I thought men and women all competed in the same nope. exact sport. That's crazy. And even now, it's still not even. They've had two Olympics now, but they get one event, and it's on the small hill. And men get three events. They get the combined, they get the small hill, and the big hill. So it's still not the same. It's fucking 2018. And we're still using these same old tired tropes that if a woman gets injured, then she's not going to be marriage material because she can't procreate and she might mess up her face or just these things are still said. Right. And it's insane to me that people can say them and mean them as this is somehow like a legitimate thing to say. Like you have no value on this planet unless you're married and have a child. Yeah, I think that's where, yeah. Uh, I don't like um, Do you remember, uh, you guys were kind of on this topic and you brought up the women's uh, world soccer team winning the, do you remember the big controversy when she scored that goal and she just ripped off her shirt? Me, at the time, I, I you know, because you see guys do that all the time. Me, at the time, I was like, I'm like, oh my gosh, she, I'm like, oh, she's got a sports bra, no big deal. That right. that was, I had initial shock to it, but then it's like, oh, it's a sports bra. It's, you know, no big deal. 
But how long did that run on the news? Yeah. People freaked out. Yeah. People lost their minds because, well, they still lose their minds because right. I don't know what the deal is with boobs. I really don't know <laughs> why. Because, like, men, like, simultaneously love them and hate them. Oh, so me, man. I love breastfeeding, them all. really bad and scary and creepy. Yeah, what is and up yet, with that? topless beaches, yay. Playboy, yes. Women in scanty tops on sports fields, no. It's just boobs. It's just skin. I never, I really don't, I personally, just me, I don't understand why another woman would come up to another woman who's breastfeeding her child and say, you know, you should really uh, cover up. Cover up. Yeah. I don't, I honestly don't understand it because to me, I, when I, I think it was because uh, as a child, uh, a small, a small child, my mother and the women around me who were uh, my aunt, uh, one of my aunts, they they breastfeed they breastfeed in front of me when I was when I was little and then uh, as I got older, you know they they stopped doing that but but I'm just saying like you know I was like three and four and you know I, I wasn't like six or seven years old and they were doing that but even then I don't I don't think it was a big deal but it was just like a natural thing to do for them you know time to feed the baby and not to mention that you're and, shamed and plus, if you don't do and, it and and plus. <laughs> You know, they also had to watch me. They couldn't go into another room and lock the d three-year-old around. And I was, I was a bit rambunctious, you know? Right. And I, I think a lot of it came from um, when women really became more in the workplace mm -hmm. and wanted to still have families. Mm -hmm. And so they need to pump and they need to do these things. And, and so it becomes this thing that has to be sort of like... Like they need a special area for that, you know. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure some women want privacy. They don't want to be pumping, right. you know, in the bathroom or at their desk. But they want the best food for their baby. And of course, we don't have family leave law in this country, so you have to go back to work right away. Right. Um, so there's all of these things that are like stacked against it. And yet, like you said, women are the most vocal. And the only thing I can think of is because it happened to them, mm -hmm. because they were shamed or they were excluded, or maybe they're bitter because they couldn't breastfeed. They've got whatever their agenda is and they feel the need to pass that anger on to someone else. Um, you know, women are the least supportive of women. I think men in general are more supportive of women. Not to say there's not the creeps, but... Um, oh yeah, there's definitely, the, there's but, definitely the creeps who are like, I'm supportive of women, but you're like, are you really supportive of women or are you just trying to get her pants bra? Right. You know, are you just, and or are you saying what you think are the right things, but, but they're not the right things? You know, like, you know, if the same Mr. Coppola, back to my story, had turned to that man and said, just a minute, sir, we're going to let the little lady finish. Right. That would have not been better. No, no. But he would have, it would have, you know, it's like, it's a, it was an option. <laughs> you know? Did, 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 uh, did he like let him have him say, and he like. Yeah, he kept yammering on. I left. Oh, you really left? So. I left wow. because I was like, well, the game is almost over, and I have interviews scheduled after right. the game. Very nice to meet you. Fuck you. Yeah, fuck <laughs> you. I gotta go. Right. But, you know, and I don't know how long, you know, he, he stayed there chawing on him, but... Um, but I'm sure he just saw, like, this was his opportunity, right? And he's been taught to go for it his whole life. And if he could just pitch this, you know, when's he ever going to get a chance to talk to Francis Ford Coppola again? But then you got to think, it's fucking Francis Ford Coppola. A, what was the last time he made a movie? Not really, really making movies not anymore. Not really making movies anymore, right? And uh, I think he's more into wine now, you know? Mm-hmm. So his daughter makes movies. His daughter makes movies, but, you know, and maybe he, maybe, I, I think she has her own production company. Even his wife directed a film, oh, believe it or not. I didn't know that. So, you know, I think he's got other people in line to, to help out. <laughs> right. I, and it's funny because so I'm friends. I'm literally friends with this. Is one of the craziest parts of my life with some of the women who played back during World War II. Played back <clears> during World <throat> Oh, really? A League, League of Their League Own. A League of Their Own. Um, they're real women. Right. And right. the League went well beyond World War II, which most people don't know. The League went until 54. Wow. And then there was a barnstorming 
all-stars that went after that for several years. So a lot of times people think, oh, well, women only played because the men weren't here, which isn't true. There was still men's baseball. It's just all the big names right. had enlisted and they weren't really sure if they were going to be able to keep baseball going with the farm system being depleted. So they started the women's league. Women's league ran for 11 years. Its most successful year was 1948 highest attendance they had a million in attendance wow. so it wasn't that the war really i mean the war started it in a way it changed it it opened the opportunity but i think it was really sort of the a lot of the radical so right you get the pendulum swing right so all right. these opportunities open women are in factories women are having you know independence women are moving away from home without being married right. you know, women are going to college because they're earning their own money and then woo, we gotta swing way back over here because yikes we're not ready for this and so then the 50s happen and women are baking cakes and pearls and heels and um <laughs> back in you know, heels i saw an ad for that the other day you know and sleeping in separate beds on tv because you know modesty and all these conservative things and we've been trying to swing it back like this whole time like the silver bullets tried but they didn't necessarily do it great and anyway so these women most of them are in their 80s and 90s the ones that are left they're all in their 80s and 90s because uh, the youngest you could have played I think was 16 15 or 16 so if you played in 1954 and yeah. you're 16 so um, anyway uh, they are exactly who you think they would be you know they are are sassy and and fun but yet they're they're polite and and they're healthy because they were athletes and all these things so i'm friends with them and they want a women's league again so they were pitching mr coppola oh really to start this women's league again to put his money into that and he believes that it needs to be co-ed um and he believes very strongly um, that the ills in society are only going to be solved by men and women working together. That would that would create uh, if you had a co-ed co league, that would really create some interesting strategy situations. Wouldn't it? You know, I mean, think about it. You're like, uh, you could start off with a female pitcher who's got like a wicked curveball, you know, and then uh, and then bring in your you know your fastball guy. You know, bring in the guy to throw the fastball. That I, yeah, I don't see why not. That would be real. I think it'd make it actually right. more interesting if you really want my opinion. Yeah, it's not a contact sport. No, it's not a strength sport no. for the most part. You know, maybe the woman's not playing third base. Maybe she's not playing right field because she's not going to gun down runners at the plate. Right. But that's okay. Yeah, because she can play second base. She can play shortstop, or she can be a junk ball pitcher that comes in in the seventh inning to get one guy out. She can bunt and steal and bring back small ball because I just heard, as much as I can't stand him, one of the announcers, small ball is dead, you know. And really? I'm watching the games with my Did boyfriend. You watch the he's like, game? watching the games with my boyfriend. He's like, wait a minute, there are runners on first and second with one out. Why are we not bunting them over? Why is this guy swinging for the fences? And I'm like, because they don't. The Brewers, no. Dodgers. I think it was the Brewers that just never did it. They had all these opportunities to do it, and they never did it. The Dodgers actually laid down a couple of bunts. The Red Sox played game this way. But think about what adding a couple of women to the team would do. And, of course, there's no women coaches. There's oh. no women umpires. Even even the NFL has women coaches now. Black women coaches. Right. <laughs> I know. And announcers. And we still have, like, you know, Jessica Mendoza gets death threats every day because she has the nerve to speak during a baseball game. Oh, and uh, what happened this year on uh, Amazon Prime? You have, for the first time, you have two female announcers on Amazon Prime calling football games. Mm-hmm. They're, so they're, it's like, yeah. for some reason, the NBA and the NFL, which I think is a horrible organization, but I'm not a football person, um, are like more cool with diversity because baseball's the oldest. Yeah. It's the slow. It's kind of like the big old desert tortoise. Right. It's like, I've been doing it this way for 300 years. We move at a slow pace. It's like they don't want to change, but they don't understand they're dying. Oh, yeah. The, the viewership is way down, and I'm like, you, you want to get fans? You know, half of the world is women? Maybe you should, you know, even if you had a woman umpire. Right, right. People yeah, would start showing up. Yeah, at least. You know, and there would be interest in umpiring. And you would create an industry where women would be going to umpire school. You create sort of like what the 99ers did. They were like, this is what's possible. Oh, my God, I want that. 
until you can see what's possible, you don't want it because you don't know that you get to want it. Do you remember the controversy back, I think it was, it might have been the 80s or 90s, I can't remember. If it was the 90s, it was the early 90s, if it was the 80s, the late 80s. The first female locker room reporter. Oh, that was you, 70s. Oh, that was the 70s. Mm. No, no, well, if they had one in the 70s, they either got rid of her after a while because I remember uh, Lawrence Taylor, a woman actually going into the men's locker room and interviewing Lawrence Taylor. And he turned around, oh, woman, you know, just like playing like that and then continued on with uh, answering her question. He was just trying to be funny, you know. But well, it, maybe the lawsuit was in the 70s and I'm thinking of there's a documentary called Let Them Wear Towels. Oh, yeah. And it's about the women fighting for equal access because if you're telling women they have to stand in the hallway and wait for the players to come out and talk to them, the players have already done their interviews. They've already right. done their showers. They want to go eat. They want to go home. They're not going to come out and answer the same questions again. So women right. were, were, were not given this equal right. opportunity to do their job. Right. Right. And so, yeah, and it's just, but it seems like, you know, every time there's a little victory, you know, it's like, okay, so all these girls sued Little League in 1972, 1973 to say, it says in the, in the rule book, girls are not allowed to play under any circumstances. It actually it really? said it. It actually said it. It was written out there. And when they were sued, I think it was the vice president at the time, his testimony was that if a girl were to be hit in the breast with a batted or thrown ball, she would develop cancer. Um, what time did you get here? Uh, a little bit before, because there's only two hour parking outside. So you want to want to pause for a little bit? And oh, I, I think I'm good till two o'clock outside. Oh, okay. I think I got here right at all right, noon. All right, then never mind. Never mind. Um, yeah, she's gonna get right, cancer if she plays baseball. <laughs> Okay. Well, first of all, how many times do you actually get hit in the breast playing baseball, Little League Youth Baseball? <laughs> okay. I never played baseball, so I don't really know. But, I mean, know. it's not like something that happens. It's not like football where your job is just slam into the other person and drag them to the ground. That is not what's happening in baseball. Well, so, if anyway. If everything goes right, the ball goes in the glove and not the chest, right? <laughs> or you hit it. Or you hit it, right. <laughs> and then you catch it. And, yes, so... They lost all these lawsuits. They lost four or five of them in different communities. Uh, Maria Pepe in New Jersey was one of them. And they finally said, okay, fine. We're not going to fight these lawsuits anymore. Girls can play. Oh, 1974, Little League Softball. Here you go, girls. <laughs> Here's your game over here, all separate. You know, because we really don't want you playing baseball. I but the courts no told clue. us we had to. My God, I'm learning so much from you today. It's not even mm. funny. I, can't, I think that's so funny. It's insidious that they did that, and they still, still today, a 10-year-old girl shows up, wants to sign up for baseball, and they're like, the softball line's over there. Wow. Still, to this day, we have this issue with this whatever agenda is that makes zero sense. Because until girls are, you know, 13... They're actually bigger than boys for the most part. Mm -hmm. They pay more attention. They have better skills. Most coaches will say, I'd rather have girls on my team because they're not picking daisies or, you know, their nose or whatever boys are doing at age 10, 11, 12. But then 13 happens, the diamond size gets bigger and puberty. And that's when everybody loses their mind. Again, back to boobs. Girls are getting boobs. We don't want them getting cancer. They better go play this other game. Well. But softball isn't easy. It's not like wiffle ball. You get hit in the boob with the softball, it's gonna hurt just as much. Yeah, because uh, I played soccer growing up and I always played on intramural teams or the league that I played in, Whittier League. We played boys and girls. I never saw like, although there, there was, there were girls who had better skills than I was. I'm, I'm not going to lie. There, there were, there were better girls. But I think the problem uh, came about is, is the strength involved. Because several times, uh, when I would challenge a girl for a ball, I actually, uh, since I had more power in my in my legs than than they did, I, I ended up. Uh, 
sending two girls to the hospital for torn torn ligaments. Right. And uh, which I'm sure was not your intention. It was. It was no. That was. And it was didn't, never and my intention. Didn't. I was just. I was like, you're getting the ball. I'm getting the ball. I didn't care who it was. Let's you know. Let's yeah. go for the ball. And. I never, it never happened to a guy. It just happened to those two girls. Hmm. So, uh, but I never had a problem playing against girls. I had plenty, I had a girl one time have no problem. She was faster than I was. She was uh, more uh, skilled with the ball than I was. And she was dirtier than, <laughs> she was <laughs> dirtier than I was. Cause I remember running, trying to keep up with her as fast as I can. And she had the ball, so she's a little bit slower. And she just, boom, right as I had my arm, I'm just right in the ribs. And I and I was like, <laughs> right. I didn't know how to react. I, if it were a guy, it would have been, I would have just like slid tackle and taken her legs out from under her. But uh, because it wasn't, I, I played different. But that I think that was, it didn't bother me. I was just surprised and shocked that a girl would do that. Would you know? be that aggressive. Would they be that aggressive? Yeah. Well, and clearly. Not every woman is going to be able to play baseball at the highest right, level. Right, right, But most men can't either. But there was a girl in the, not too long ago, in the Little League, uh, I don't know if it Monet was... Monet Davis? Yeah. Yeah. She threw, she threw faster than, than I can throw as an adult. And yep. She, what did she have, like a 70 mile an hour fastball? 70, 75. Yeah. You know, at 13. At 13. Um, Someone should be scouting this girl but i think she's i've met her and she's amazing and her parents are amazing and she's very grounded but she looks at her future and says i like base i like baseball but i really like basketball too and i have a future in basketball mm. i can play professionally i can play in the olympics so why am i gonna fight to keep playing this game where i literally have no future i can't even get a college scholarship whereas this this is it's all laid out for me they're gonna come for me. I was in the cover of Sports Illustrated. Mm -hmm. I can go to UConn, I can go wherever. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm really excited to see what she does with her life outside of sports because another really important study that was done, 93% of women who are in C-suite positions in blue chip companies, so corner office, VPs, et cetera, president, CEOs, played youth sports. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's an outlet when, Especially intramural sports, because you're going to have advantages and disadvantages no matter who you're playing against. But I think at a young age, you're, we're all pretty much... Right. And you learn teamwork, you learn and you learn healthy competition, and you learn leadership skills, and you learn just so many things that are applicable to life. You know, boys learn what you're capable of, what girls are capable of. Girls learn what boys are capable of. You learn that there's a place for everybody on the team. There's just all these things. And by restricting that or, or trying to put a, a, a cover over that, we're damaging society, which is kind of what Francis Ford Coppola was talking about, not to put words in his mouth, but he was saying, we're only going to get better if we both realize that we both hold up half the sky. Right? We were both here for a reason, and women's job is not simply to procreate. Right. We are here to contribute equally. And that's, um, you know, it's funny how with, with documentary film, there's some filmmakers who deliberately try to not become advocates. They're really trying to just, here's both sides of the story. You audience make up your own mind. I'm just here to share the knowledge. Right. And, and that's extremely valid. And I think it's very hard. Yeah. But then there are other filmmakers kind of like myself and there's a um, British filmmaker called Jeremy Gilly. And he made a film maybe 10 years ago called the day after peace. And it was about the fact that we have no international day of peace. Oh, that's interesting. We have an international day of ice cream, <laughs> but we don't have one for peace. And well, you know, ice cream just, it's so I mean, yummy. It, of course, it deserves a week, ice. Yeah, but um, week. so does peace. Um, right. And his, uh, so he, you know, his film is about petitioning the UN to get the charter to do the whole thing. And that's just at the very beginning of the film. And then it goes, like stuff happens and you're like, whoa. Um, but he's actually said, I'm not really a filmmaker anymore. I'm a full-time peace activist. 
And that's what I feel like is happening to me. I'm turning into a full-time gender equality advocate because no one's saying these things. You know, even, you know, like, like feminists get like this bad name and, and blue wave and running for Congress and stuff, but they're still playing the male rules. So being a female film documentary, documentarian, um, what struggles do you come across when trying to make one of your films? Well, interestingly, like, do you find uh, do you find men like oh, not taking you seriously? I guess I'm saying sure, um, and trying to press an advantage, um, which has happened. I've gotten backed into corners at parties at can where somebody's trying to play a little grab ass, or you know, because they were interested in hearing about my right. film, right? And then it turns out they're not at all interested in hearing about my film. They're interested in getting me into a dark corner, which I guess as a woman, I'm supposed to be like, well, I guess this is a price of admission to the table if he really will put money into my film. But I'm smart enough to be like, I need to see the money first, right? Right? <laughs> okay. Right? Because I've gonna... known too many men. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's like, uh, you want me to fuck you? See the cash, bitch. Um, which, of course, is a, I, you know. I mean, I mean facetious. I am, as too. As well, but, but at the same time, there's certainly no way that even if I were interested in this man, you know, and I was going to be a little flirty and, like, trying to play my feminine wiles and try to play that game, that I'm going to do anything without a contract. Right, right, you know? right. And I think, unfortunately, I think a lot of women do fall for that. I met this woman out here at the Women in Film Convention a couple years ago, and she was a strange one. She was definitely one of those on the crazy remember me right, spectrum. Right, uh -huh. And I think she had been told, she was from Arizona or Texas or something, and she, moved, she was going to be an actress. And I think somebody had told her to always wear the same clothes to a callback. Which is a piece of advice. It helps them remember right, you. Right, right. Um, you know, and if you got a call back, hopefully they remember you anyway. But it's just one of those things that's out there. So she started wearing the same clothes to every day of the conference. Okay. Which people noticed. Right. Because they weren't just clothes. She had like, like I Dream of Jeannie harem pants on and stuff. And they were blue. And it it was it was strange. Right. You right. know, and even if you love harem pants... And you like, you think they look good on you and whatever. Maybe you have a couple different pairs. <laughs> yeah, a couple different colors. People will still remember, oh, you're the girl <laughs> in the hair and pants. Yeah. You don't have to wear the same ones. Uh -huh. Anyway, she was comes she wearing, back. Was she wearing a belly shirt? I seem to remember that she might have been. <laughs> and, and, and not the thing that she couldn't. I mean, she was right. tiny and, and right. blonde and adorable. And, you know, this was her... You know, I just wanted she, to know how far she went with the. Yeah, she, she was stopped at the genie bed. Yeah, she didn't have the high pony, but <laughs> um, but anyway, so she went to the Beverly Center for some reason on a break, and she came back, and she was so excited. She met these three guys, that were from Israel, and they had a script, and they wanted her to come to their hotel room to audition. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And she's telling this story, oh, and all of these friends that are from outside L.A. are like, oh, that's amazing, Dina, or whatever her name was. As I'm going to have to say something. I'm going to have to say something, and she's not going to like it, and how am I going to say it? And I finally just said, that's not how things are done here that are legitimate. She was furious. And she was like, how dare I? And I'm just jealous. And I'm trying to take away her opportunity. And all I said was, how would I live with myself if you're the dead body in the dumpster on the 11 o'clock news? Right. I have to say something. You can make up your own mind. But what I'm telling you is if these men are legitimate and just don't know any better, then they will meet you in a coffee shop. They will be okay if you bring a friend with you to the audition. They will meet you in the lobby of the hotel. You do not go to their hotel room, three strange men mm. who are not, don't even live here. Right. You, you, you just can't do that. That seems very, like, I, I, the reason why I laughed because I was, like, completely shocked that somebody would be like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. But that's, that's the trap because people want the dream so much that they're willing to do it. You'll hear some of these interviews of, of the Me Too survivors and they'll say, I was aware that this was the price of admission. 
that I needed to play these games, that I needed to let men fondle me, that I needed to flirt back, that I needed to do these things, and that's what was going to get me my job. But my talent is what would keep me the job, because we all know getting the job is the hard part. Right. Doing the job is not hard. Most of these jobs in the industry are not hard once you have the training or the understanding or, you know, even acting, the less acting you do is usually better. You know, it's not about, you know, bringing the tears and all of these things. And so I just felt like, I'm, I'm really glad I said something to her. It might have been fine. But the point is, there's a safer, better way of doing this that you need to protect yourself. You are not a bargaining chip. Your body is your body. And if you decide that you want to sleep with this man, then you get to do that too. And maybe that turns into a movie role for you, as it so often does. Maybe it doesn't. And maybe you have a lifelong regret and disappointment because of it. But you have to say, these are my rules. And this is where I'm taking my stand. And I, I said, blame it on me. Tell them you've got a friend who's all hysterical and insists on meeting them in the coffee shop. And if they say no, then they weren't really interested in you being in their movie. I'm they sorry. Were, they were interested in your genie pants and what was it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because when I worked as an intern for Roger Corman in the casting department, I got flirted with by pretty women a lot. I, I'm, I don't think I'm an ugly guy, but <clears throat> I don't think I'd, I'd never got so much flirting in my life. <laughs> But, you know, I, once they realized after coming back that I really had no say no in it. No power. No power whatsoever. <laughs> the flirting kind of stopped. Just to be like, hi, how are you? Things going well? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it got pretty matter of fact. And, yeah. Well, which power was, is sexy. Which, which, was, which was fine because, you know, I, I became friends with a couple of the actresses who would come in every so often. And it, was, it was fine. I didn't, I didn't feel sad about it. But. Yeah, I'm just saying that I experienced that, that flirtiness, which I was like, right. why is this girl flirting with me? <laughs> because women are told that's how you get jobs in this town. We're told that from movies. We're told that from books. We're told that from our experience that you just, you know, let, you let them get a little handsy. Well, uh, can you can you tell me a time where, uh, aside from being cornered in that one party, uh, another experience where you were like, all right, I'm going to, I mean, not flirt, but you went in with the intentions of like, this is going to be something that we're going to discuss and it's, the project's going to get out of that, but it turned into something different. Well, it's not quite what you're talking about, but it was it, definitely another one of these seminal moments that, that, that impacted my life. So Store, the film I was talking about, about storage units. I met this man at the LA Film Festival. I'm excited about this film idea. I kept running into him in lines. You know, it was sort of, right. you know, it just seemed like we were supposed to have a conversation. Right. Not a dating thing, right. but he just seemed really sort of awkward and kind of shy and looked at his feet a lot when he talked. And, and he said that he was interested in investing in a project. And I just thought, well, in this town, maybe nobody's taking him seriously because he's talking like this all the time and he's very soft-spoken. And so I told him about my project. He said he was interested and we met a couple of times and, um, and he decided to go ahead and, and fund this project. Of course, I knew nothing about filmmaking. Right. Um, and my original budget was $35,000. And that included buying a camera and mostly transportation to go to the various places to um, to film this film. Um, and that was great. And we set up a bank account and an LLC and we, he transferred the money and everything was just normal right. until the film was done. And then all of a sudden he's like, you know, he invited me to this party up in Malibu that had supposedly a lot of rich investors at it. And I'm like, well, Christmas, rich investors in Malibu, that seems like a place I should be right. if you're inviting me. I of course I'm going to go. Well, I get there and the host of the party comes up to me and she's like, oh, thank God you finally got here. This poor man has been like out of his mind. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, he just didn't know if you were going to get here and whatever. And I was like, well, yeah, that's really weird because... You know, this isn't like a date or anything. Well, it turns out it was supposed to be a date. Oh, okay. I'm like, I am not privy to this information. I did not think that we were, this was a date. And, and he's like, oh, well, I'm formally announcing my intention to date you. 
No, he's formally announcing. Okay. I'm like, well, that's really that's not weird. how. That's not how this works. <laughs> um, and I said, it's, I, I'm in a relationship, and he got really angry that I never told him that. I'm like, well, I don't tend to bring my dating life into business negotiations. Right. right. It's not like I should say. Oh, and by the way. Yeah, are you really interested in, inv in investing in my film? Because I have a boyfriend. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, what, it wouldn't even occur to me to say that. And the fact that he was upset that, you know, I, I didn't disclose. Right. And I'm like, well, you didn't ask me. Right. You know, you, you're not in charge you know, he seemed to think that that's how it worked, that men just were in charge and they just told women how things were. And I'm like, have you met me? Because this is who I have always been. Like, it's not like I just woke up one day and I'm like, I'm gonna be a feminist and I'm gonna be female forward and I'm gonna completely change my persona. I have always been this way. My dad had four daughters and he ran a construction company and we all know how to use power tools and we all know how to split and stack cordwood and we all know how to change our own tires because my dad taught us these things. Had he had a son, maybe I wouldn't be so well-rounded, but anyway. Once say a girl who didn't know how to pump her up. Oh, wait a second. I married her. <laughs> well, hopefully she was from Oregon where it's illegal or New Jersey. <laughs> it's illegal to pump your own gas in those states. So. No, no, it was orange. I, I swear to God, she, we went to the first time I'm gassing up with her. She just like goes to the full service. They don't have full service anymore, but back then they had full service. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm going to full service. Why are you going to full service? I'm like, because my dad gave me the credit card so I can go. I'm like, okay, well, just pull into self and, you know, I'll and uh, go pay the guy. And, and, you know, she's like, well, I don't even know where the gas tank's at. And I went, okay. Because I said, I'll, I'll pump the gas. And she's like, I don't even know where the gas tank's at. And I'm like, one of those cars that was behind. Yeah. So she didn't know. Like under yeah. the license plate. Yeah, it was under the license plate. Yeah. So she didn't know that. I'm like, I mean, okay. And it's I, I'm not judging her at all, right. but it's really hard for me to see women who are that vulnerable. Because you are. You have made yourself really vulnerable. When I got my driver's license, I was so excited to go take a ride, and I came out into the driveway, and all the tires were off the car. <laughs> my dad says, you want to go for a ride? You need to know how to change a tire. Because if you break down, get a flat tire on a dark road in the middle of the night, you need to know how to get yourself out of this situation. It wasn't hard. No. I was annoyed because right. I was 17. And I just <laughs> wanted to go for a ride. But the first time I got a flat tire, no panic. I knew what I was doing. My dad prepared me, you know, to be independent. And my mom, too. My mom taught me I know how to sew. I know how to hang curtain rods. I know how to cook. I know how to bake. You know, and not just saying that mom did the girl things because we gardened. And you and say you're already we... dating someone, right? I am. Okay. And you like baseball? Okay. And I like baseball. All right. I know. I'm kind of the perfect woman. I'm not. I'm not. No. It's fine. I'm, I'm taking two. But, you know, for like a second there, I was like, well, you know, maybe we could work something You know. I'm just easy. So, anyway, back to this man. Yeah. Um... So then things got really uncomfortable. He started showing up at my apartment, oh. uh, calling me, crying, sending me crazy emails. He, he somehow got through the security door in my apartment one morning and was pounding on my door before seven. Oh. And I'm like, I'm not answering the door. Are you fucking me? Like, and, and how dare you assume I'm alone? You know, and everything. So I, when I, he finally left, I had opened the door and there was a book by Dr. Laura. Dr. Laura. With a post-it note uh -huh. that said, so you can understand my feelings and morals towards women. <laughs> <laughs> Again. If there was I, ever a female misogynist, it's Dr. Laura, in my opinion. And I said to him, I said, I don't understand. I am literally your worst nightmare. <laughs> I am a socialist from Vermont who believes in women's rights, who doesn't want to get married and doesn't want to have children. Why would you want me? It makes no sense. He was from Orange County. He was in the Gulf War. He, red state. 
you can't change me and right. why would you want to i will just make you crazy this makes no sense so that just you know i finally had to file a restraining order wow and that was a horrible process because we got in front of some old white judge who could give a crap who said well you know we don't hand these things out all willy-nilly you know it makes <laughs> life really difficult for the man actually honest to god said that, said to, that to my face wow. when i was in that courtroom scared out of my mind that i thought this guy was gonna hurt me mm -hmm. and i had to ask for your help and that's what you said to me you son of a bitch wow and i had to go back three times three times three times before i finally got a restraining order and the only reason i got it was because he went off on a bender and told somebody that everything would be perfect if I were just dead. Ooh. And the LAPD came to my door to warn me there had been a credible threat against my life. Wow. It took a threat against your life for that judge to finally go, oh, okay, I'll, I'll give it to you now. Yeah, and he even talked to him, you know, because we're in the courtroom together. And he's mm. like, well, you know, he's a serious man. He's got a lawyer. He needs to just, you know, he's like, you just need to stop this. And I'm like, he's damaged. He's not right. I don't know why. Maybe it's because he was in the army. Maybe it's because he was in the, I don't know. But I did none of this. I honestly never flirted, never hugged, never kissed on the cheek, never lingered too long. I never did any, because I know how to do those things. Mm -hmm. I never did any of them and it happened to me anyway. And I'm still obviously a little bit upset about it because the other thing that happened out well, of this. Hold on one second. I'm going to close the window. I'm going to pause the recording.